Uh, the cylinder seal that uh, a lot of ancient astronaut proponents uh, put out as evidence of advanced knowledge of the solar system, uh, at least on the part of the Sumerians and the, the Akkadians, uh, sometimes referred to as the twelfth planet seal. Uh, it, it's popularized by Zechariah Sitchin. It, the, the scholarly uh, nomenclature for this is cylinder seal VA-243 uh, in the, in the uh, Berlin Museum. Supposedly, this shows uh, the sun and 11 other dots so that we have this idea of 12 planets in the solar system. Well, aside from the fact that the seal never says that, there is writing on it, has nothing to say about that. And in terms of the way these things are portrayed, uh, you don't have dots uh, representing planets uh, in a lot of uh, ancient Near Eastern iconography. And there, there are other disconnects that people can find out about uh, on my SitchinIsWrong.com website. If they go up to VA243, you'll, you'll see that. But there's a fundamental problem here, and that is if you actually look at ancient Near Eastern iconography, these dots, uh, dots are usually the mechanism by which stars uh, are, are drawn. So at best, we would have a reference to sort of 12 celestial bodies, 12 stars at best. But again, this, the seal doesn't actually say that. There seems to be an assumption that this number 12 refers to planets and doesn't refer to things like constellations. Uh, the Babylonians were well known as being really into astrology. Astrology and astronomy in those days were somewhat blurred. And there's this sort of odd assumption that if the Babylonians had a zodiac, a 12, um, 12 constellation, 12 point zodiac, that somehow the zodiac represents the universe. Uh, you'll see this, this sort of assumption, again, about this advanced astronomical knowledge that doesn't make any sense. You don't need spaceships, you don't need aliens to come up with a zodiac. What you need are two sets of good eyes and a sky, okay, and you can go and look. And this is how zodiacs came about. The fact that a system would record 12 constellations in a certain order and assign meaning to them does not mean that they had a vast knowledge or any knowledge of the greater universe. Again, this is just a disconnect in thinking that you'll see in ancient astronaut literature, moving from zodiac to, you know, now we know about other galaxies and interstellar travel. It just doesn't make any sense at all, because all these things just depend on something as simple as naked eye observation. There are actually other terms besides Anunnaki for the Anunnaki. Uh, Anunnaki is the one that's familiar with most people who are sort of into the ancient alien uh, idea. Uh, Anuna is another term. The Anuna and the Anunnaki are the same uh, group of deities in Sumerian Mesopotamian mythology. Uh, you also have uh, Anunnaku, if you're again searching on the internet or maybe some other resource, you want to try all these terms out to get to information. Uh, the term itself means of royal seed or princely seed. Because the Anunnaki were considered the offspring of Anu, or An, uh, the great god of heaven. And also we have, again, Anunnaki. They were also the offspring of An and his consort, Ki, the heaven and earth. Uh, these, again, this divine coupling, the way the Mesopotamians conceived uh, their pantheon. So they are a, a significant group of gods. They are not the highest gods uh, in, in this mythology, but they're a significant group early on especially. Later on, they sort of get demoted to the netherworld, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, the Mesopotamian or Sumerian hell uh, might be the way we describe it. That's a little, uh, little beyond the pale, maybe a little over the top, because you can't necessarily compare our concept of hell with what the Sumerians were thinking, but it's the realm of the dead. And how they got there, we don't know from Sumerian texts. They sort of lost their elevated position. But that, in a nutshell, is who they are. They're very important, uh, even when they are relegated to the underworld. Yep. Now, you'll often read, especially in the writings of Zechariah Sitchin, that the Anunnaki means something like, you know, they who from heaven came, or 
again, some, some other sort of description that makes them sound like aliens or extraterrestrials. Uh, there isn't a source on the planet by any Sumerian scholar uh, that would agree with that definition. Again, it's not a difficult term. You could look it up in uh, Gwendolyn Lykes' Dictionary of the Ancient Near East Mythology. Jeremy uh, Green has one. Uh, you will find that the term means of royal seed or princely seed. Online, you could go to the, the Pennsylvania Sumerian Dictionary. It's the University of Pennsylvania's project. Uh, creating a Sumerian dictionary that you can access online, but they're putting the results into print. And one of the first volumes is the A volume, and you can look it up uh, on there. I have a picture actually of the page on my website, and you can see what Sumerian scholars, real Sumerian scholars, understand about the term. Uh, I personally don't think that Sitchin knew Sumerian at all, because if you're going to get even a term associated with a very important group of deities, if you're not going to get that right, then I have to wonder what else you're going to get wrong. I often get sent uh, pictures of what are purported to be and, and what to our eye looks like some sort of serpentine feminine figure, uh, uh, some sort of figurine or, or, or idol or something. Uh, from Mesopotamia with some note about, aha, you know, here's an Anunnaki. The Anunnaki are the reptilian race that controls the planet, yada, yada, yada. Well, these figures are actually very well known. They are from, in, in many cases, a site uh, called Ubayid, or the Jemdet Nasser period uh, in Mesopotamian archaeology. The, the problem for the ancient astronaut theorist is that all of these figurines are pre- historic. Just go up, you know, Google them, Google Ubaid, U-B-A-I-D, on the internet with figurine and put something in like serpent or reptile or something. You're going to get uh, information on them. They're all prehistoric sites, which means, by definition, they were created and put there before writing. Why is that important? Because there has never been a single shred of writing, shrink, single piece, single tablet, single line of anything that has these figurines identified. There is no basis, there's no evidence in Mesopotamian archaeology, in the history of the field, that connects these figurines with the Anunnaki. That is an entirely invented connection. So right away you have a fundamental problem. You cannot use these figurines as proof of the worship of the Anunnaki when we have no idea, at least if we care what the Mesopotamians said, or in this case couldn't say because they couldn't write yet, uh, if we care about what the Mesopotamians left us, if we're going to honor that, we can't make these claims. They have no basis in the evidentiary record. But this is something that people who promote these ideas just never seem to come across or conveniently ignore for the sake of their audience because they want you to believe that, wow, some archaeologists found an Anunnaki. Well, no, they didn't. They found a figure that sort of looks like a reptilian head or a serpent figure or something. And about that, uh, serpents and serpent iconography, serpent uh, idols and whatnot are fairly common in the ancient Near East, and I think the reasons are fairly simple. Uh, serpents were often looked at as figures associated with healing and rebirth and life. And the reason for that is simple. You're dealing with a pre-scientific culture. And to them, when they see a serpent shed its skin, it speaks of rebirth, almost as if it's being reborn, regenerated, made new. Uh, so it naturally became a symbol for regenerative power, healing power and regeneration. So the fact that serpent figures were venerated in such a way isn't surprising to me at all. But there's actually no evidence that connects them in any way with the Anunnaki. And so this is another point that Sitchin has literally invented. And one of the oddities you'll see when you read the works of Zechariah Sitchin and those who follow him are taking a term like Nephilim and somehow getting a translation like those who came down, again, trying to make them sound like ancient astronauts, or people of the fiery rockets. Uh, both of those translations 
are demonstrably incorrect in Biblical Hebrew. I think the latter one is just patently absurd. Uh, but they're incorrect, and we know they're incorrect because the idea of coming down or who were sent down, uh, you can't really get there if you think Nephilim came from the Hebrew verb nafal, which means to fall. It would be spelled entirely differently in the Hebrew Bible if the meaning was to be sent down. Again, I have a, a discussion of this on my website, sitchiniswrong.com, if you click on the tab for Nephilim. The other issue is that the normal Hebrew word for come down is yarad, which is not nafal, very obviously. And so these sorts of meanings are contrived. Uh, they really have no basis in Hebrew grammar or Hebrew vocabulary. The average person can access Sumerian and br more broadly Mesopotamian material these days through two means. Uh, one would be anthologies. Uh, these are English translations of large portions of what's available to translate in terms of cuneiform tablets. There are a number of anthologies out there. I have this information on my podcast website and on some of my other websites. Uh, anthologies are good. They include all the major epics. These are all the major epics that Sitchin quotes from Enuma Elish, Atrahasis, Gilgamesh. You can find them in English translations uh, all over the place. I would not trust so much the ones that are on the web. You're going to have to invest a little money if you're serious to get the most up-to-date scholarly translations, but you can get them. The other thing you can do is there are some databases online that allow you to search through Sumerian texts. And I have a video on my uh, website, www.sitchinisrong.com. If you go there and you click on the Anunnaki tab, I will show you how to search through something called the Electronic Text Corpus of Sumerian Literature. I'll show you how you can search for all the occurrences of the word Anunnaki and then click through to English translations of all those occurrences. You can find this material and I would encourage you to do so because you can check up on Zechariah Sitchin, you can check up on me. Uh, when I claim that there are no texts, there are no tablets, that have, for instance, the Anunnaki on Nibiru or associated with Nibiru, that Nibiru isn't a planet beyond Pluto. When I say those things, how easy would it be to prove me wrong if you knew how to search for those terms? It'd be real easy. And I encourage you to check up on me, check up on everybody else, and do the work. You can access this material and know who's telling you the truth. One of the, the major resources that people can use, that's available for free, in fact, uh, for digging into the vocabulary of Sumerian and Akkadian, is something known as the CAD, C-A-D, the Chicago Assyrian Dictionary. Now, this actually began in the 40s and was completed a couple of years ago. So we're talking about a 60-year project. And the aim of the CAD, when it began, was to create a dictionary that had entries on every word in the corpus of these languages. And not only every word, but also to, to attempt to cite all of the places, all of the occurrences of these terms in context on the tablets. Now, if you went to the University of Chicago today, this is where the CAD was done, there are rooms full of index cards for these vocab terms with tablet citations on them. That's how it began, sort of as a massive card catalog that has now been produced in dictionary form. It's 20 volumes or so. And you can access it online through the Oriental Institute website, the University of Chicago. They're all in PDF. So this is another resource that Zechariah Sitchin could have used, but apparently didn't, that you can use. Uh, when I started to get into uh, Zechariah Sitchin's work, I, I naturally, again, this is the way academics think, I wanted to establish his credentials. And to this day, I haven't been able to find, nor have other people whom I've asked to help, uh, people who like Sitchin, I've never been able to find any actual credentials uh, of him knowing any of the languages or being credentialed in any way in ancient Near Eastern studies. 
And so, again, that leads me uh, to suspect that we have, again, an amateur here who got interested in this idea and sort of ran with it. But I have not been able to find a single credential that would qualify him to speak as a scholar in these areas or that would help other scholars sort of look at him as someone in the guild, you know, someone that, that they can sort of view as a peer. Uh, without those credentials, they're not going to give him the time of day. Yeah, I, I have personally found the writings of Sitchin very frustrating uh, from the perspective of a scholar and an academic, uh, which is what I am. It's sort of reflexively what I look for. Uh, it's very hard to follow his trail because he just doesn't cite sources. Even if he cites a source, for instance, an ancient text, he doesn't give you sort of the chapter and verse. He doesn't give you the tablet numbers, the line numbers, and, and, and whatnot. Uh, even when he does bother to mention uh, a specific source, and he's always using a known translation, a known English translation, uh, except when he you know, starts putting uh, the Anunnaki on Nibiru as, the, as if that was their home planet or things like that. He's not using uh, translations for that. He's just making that part up. But when he actually does cite a translation, a known English translation, uh, he even doesn't give you the page numbers half the time. It's just really frustrating as a scholar because what scholars do, what they're trained to do, if, if they're real scholars, is they write in such a way that you can follow what they're doing so that you can review it, you can follow the argument and interact with it. Sitchin just makes that a very, very difficult task. And as an academic, uh, I have to look at it and say, it's either really lazy or he doesn't want you to be able to check up on him. It's one or the other. While we're talking about uh, the field of Sumerology, uh, Sumerian scholarship, uh, I often hear from people, uh, I don't think Sitchin ever himself claimed to be one of like the three or four people in the world who could read Sumerian and divine or decipher these texts. That just isn't true. Uh, Sumerian doesn't have a lot of people involved. There are probably two or three hundred people who do Sumerian studies. I happen to know two of them personally. One is in the town I live at the local university. Another is a friend, uh, Dick Averbeck, uh, who's a Sumerian scholar that teaches at a divinity school near Chicago. Uh, they'll tell you that there are a couple hundred people who do this. None of them know who Zechariah Sitchin is, and if they do, it, He's sort of the butt of jokes because of the ancient astronaut stuff. Sumerian scholars just don't have any, any real time for this sort of thing. But the idea that Sitchin is able to do or was able to do something that few others could do uh, really is not the case. Good. Was Sitchin a misguided scholar? or is he in it for personal gain or something else? Well, I get asked this question a lot. Uh, the easy part of this is I wouldn't call Sitchin a scholar in any regard. So I wouldn't call him a misguided scholar. Uh, I, misguided, I guess, is a flexible enough term. I look at Sitchin as someone, at least initially when he got into this, as an amateur who had a real keen interest in the ancient world, uh, felt that he really had stumbled onto something that others had not noticed or perhaps others didn't want to notice. And from that point on, he became convinced. He convinced himself and sort of this, this sort of accrued in his mind as some legitimate sort of theory uh, that he ran with. Now, you know, maybe made later on when he started to make millions and millions of dollars, uh, he sort of began to perpetuate his own brand or he saw it was sort of a, a lucrative co cottage industry. I mean, who knows? I, I, um, if you know, you're producing something that you think people like, you know people like and you think it's worthwhile, you're going to produce more of it. So I don't begrudge him at all uh, for making money. Uh, if you know that you're duping someone, and you're making money off that, that's a different story. But I don't know that I can say that that's what was in Sitchin's head. But I do think he was misguided. Uh, I don't think he is a scholar. I've said publicly before, I don't think he knew any of the languages. Uh, he's probably a native Hebrew speaker because uh, he was Jewish. But frankly, that doesn't impress me because my 
13-year-old is a native English speaker, and I'm not going to view him as a Bible scholar. He can read the Bible, but he's not getting anywhere near it when it comes to doing exegesis and figuring out what the text means. Being able to read a language is a whole lot different than being able to analyze it. Those of you out there, you might want to think about your high school English class. You might all be English readers, but can you diagram a sentence? Can you talk about the tenses used in a, in a piece of narrative prose? Can you do those sorts of things? That's what scholars do in biblical languages and in these other languages. That's what they're trained to do. And I don't think Sitchin could do any of that. So I do think he was misguided. I, I, I won't view him as a scholar. And I, I tend to sort of leave it at that. I don't want to attribute bad motives to him because I just don't know. Another example of something that you'll commonly see, uh, you'll have maybe on either side of, of a crucified uh, Christ in religious art, you'll have what appears to be sort of a, a round shape uh, on one side and the other with people in them or faces in them. Uh, these are very well-known, uh, again, motifs and features of religious art, and they refer to the sun and the moon. Uh, again, the sun and the moon, uh, if you read the New Testament, You'll know that the sun and the moon, sun turning to blood, moon turning to blood, that, those sorts of things are associated with the crucifixion account and, of course, the second coming as well. So what these are is these are personifications of celestial objects, sun and moon in this case, uh, that are given personality and, and uh, given sort of human form as characters in the story or characters in the narrative. They are not UFOs. Again, all of this, these kinds of things are well known to people who make their living in the art history field. Uh, they're not astounded by the, uh, this amazing thing that they see in a painting. It surely must be something from another planet. Uh, they don't look at, look at it that way at all because they just know. They've seen hundreds of these and they know what it is and they know why it's there. Well, I often get asked about the whole ancient astronaut topic and sort of, you know, why do people believe this? Uh, why shouldn't they believe this? You know, why should we, you know, Mike, why should we listen to you and, and think that, that you're giving us any better information than the Ancient Aliens show or Eric Von Daniken or Zechariah Sitchin or whatnot? Uh, there's a number of ways that I sort of look at that and would challenge people to think about uh, what they're doing. Uh, one would be just the use of evidence. Uh, it, what I find in a lot of these sorts of books and the television show would be the same sort of thing is that you'll be shown something or you will be told something and there's really very little context given and there's really really very little direction uh, that people give uh, their, their listeners, their audience to sort of check up on them. Uh, I think you as a listener, uh, someone who's sort of imbibing on this information, getting into this topic, you really need to start thinking clearly about what can or cannot be said about a piece of evidence. For example, when I say uh, about the works of, of Zechariah Sitchin, look, there are these deities in Sumerian mythology called the Anunnaki. There is this word called Nibiru. But when I say that there isn't a single text that connects them, there isn't a single text that has Nibiru as a planet beyond Pluto. In fact, one of the texts that does mention Nibiru does not have it coming into our solar system every 3,600 years, but in fact, every year it's something that's observed. When I say things like this, I try to give people the resources, the information that they can check up on that. because. That is the truth. That is the, the factual reality of the situation. Uh, you need to pause and think about that and check up on me or, 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 or the work of others. And when it hits you that, you know, there really isn't a text that says this, I know it's tempting to want to persist and continue to believe in this idea that you find attractive, but it's not honest and it's not, you're not being honest to yourself. Uh, you need to really look at evidence for what it says and go with that and sort of recalibrate and move off and try to think better about things. 
Uh, so that's what I, I try to do, and, and many others in the field try to do that too. Uh, do not become enslaved to an authority figure. They should always be willing to direct you to information so that you can do the work and you can check on them. If they don't, you should be suspicious. Again, this is just something that as a professor, uh, as a scholar, I try to get my students to, to consider and think about. Because let's face it, how many of us are really into this kind of stuff? Uh, ancient languages, how many people do that? You, you get a, somebody who comes along like Zechariah Sitchin and starts spouting things about Sumerian and Akkadian and Hebrew and whatnot. Uh, how many people really have the ability to check up on them? Well, the answer is not many. And it just sounds like a horrible amount of work to gain that knowledge so that you can evaluate what they say. And I understand that. But you should not let that allow you to check your brain in at the door. You should ask that source, that person, hey, where can I look? What can I do? What can I access to try to test what you're saying? And if they're not giving you that access, if they're not giving you that direction, you ought to be suspicious. You ought not to dispense uh, other ideas in favor of theirs if they will not do that service for you. And I would say that regardless, even if it's somebody on the other side. They need to direct you to information. They ought to have that much respect for you as a person, uh, as an intellectual being, as somebody who has something going on upstairs that you would want to and would be willing to put the time uh, into checking up on them. Uh, the other thing I, I would add to this is I have found that a lot of people uh, are attracted to the ancient astronaut idea because they're dissatisfied with what it is replacing, uh, either traditional theism, belief in a god, uh, Christianity. Uh, they may have been burned by someone who believes in God. They may have been mistreated uh, by someone who claims to be a Christian. Uh, they may have had some personal pain uh, that turns them against, again, what we traditionally think of as belief in God or Christianity or Judaism or something like that, something more mainstream. Uh, that's understandable uh, on one level, but on another level, uh, I can say this again a, a, as an academic, as a scholar, uh, a lot of those situations uh, really involve having God and what he's doing and the Christian life or Christian belief, Christianity itself, poorly parsed for you. Uh, you need to also take it upon yourself before you reject something like a belief in God, that God could actually uh, have some uh, control uh, over the, the tragic circumstances of life, that there could be a real purpose to it, uh, that, that God is actually going to uh, take that and turn something good for it. Even the, even the idea that God was somehow responsible is something I uh, would reject in many cases, but you, you'll often hear that as though God is mean or vindictive or needs evil to get something else done. If I were taught those things, I would be in the same boat. I would want to reject that. But you need to take it upon yourself to start, start to find out, well, is this really the only way that the God of the Bible or the Christian faith can be parsed? I mean, do other people parse it a different way? Uh, maybe that will help you deal with your pain or whatever point of dissatisfaction you have with this. But in any case, it's not a good solution to either a problem of pain or some other feature of discontent for you to not do the legwork and then substitute something else like an ancient astronaut belief that is demonstrably false. It's not going to help you. It's not going to take away pain. It's not going to give you intellectual satisfaction. Uh, it will force you to sort of protect it. And if it's true, it shouldn't need protecting. Uh, I've sort of become uh, primarily known as uh, being what I hope is uh, a charitable or maybe a, a firm but gentle uh, debunker of the ancient alien idea. And I'm very forthright that I don't believe uh, that because what I need first is some scientific proof that aliens are real, that they exist. And then what I need is evidence that they came here. If I had the first thing, then we'd have something to work with. And then for me, the idea of, of alien visitation would be on the table because and now I know that they're real. 
On the other hand, though, uh, I'm also known for the idea that I can accept that. I can accept the idea as a Christian, as a biblical scholar, as a theologian. I can accept the idea tomorrow, today, uh, that there is intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. I don't have any theological problem with that. If you're interested in my thoughts on that, I write a blog called UFO Religions. It's just uforeligions.com. And on that blog, I have a video of a presentation that I usually entitle something like, Could Conservative Christianity Accommodate a Genuine Extraterrestrial Reality? And I'd invite you to go watch that. When it comes to the pyramids, I think the most valuable recent research that's been done is by Jean-Pierre Houdin. Uh, I like his theory, uh, but he would be the first one to admit that we can't say that his ideas are the explanation for how the pyramids were built or that we even need that. Uh, there's actually been a lot of academic research on pyramid building, megalithic architecture, uh, how stones of that size and greater were moved, how they were put side by side tightly. It's actually very simple in terms of applied physics. Uh, on my Paleo Babble site, again, if you click on the topic for pyramids, you'll find a number of peer-reviewed articles that I have online that you can read about ancient Egyptian engineering techniques. But Houdin's idea of an internal ramp, I think, uh, is coherent. I think there's good circumstantial evidence for it. If you have watched the National Geographic special uh, on his view, I think you would agree that there is good circumstantial evidence for it. It has a, has a lot of explanatory power for a lot of the fundamental questions. And I think it's important because Houdin's theory depends on a very simple idea in engineering, both in the ancient world and in today's world, and that is the use of weight and counterweight uh, using the weight of one object to lift a, an object of greater weight. It's simple leverage, it's physics, it's applied physics. You don't need levitation or ancient aliens. What you need is you need a clever and a, and a good knowledge of how weight and counterweight work, and you can get a pyramid out of that. So I, I would recommend uh, Houdin's work is really worth taking a look at, and along with the other material as well, that scholars have produced. A lot of the good material on Baalbek is unfortunately not in English. Uh, and it's also unfortunately in older book resources. You're not gonna find much on Baalbek that's very useful online, except, and I'll give my, my own blog here a plug, uh, at paleobabble.com, if you look under the category for megaliths, you will find a, a lengthy article that I did on Baalbek where I found a publicly available article in French that dealt with Baalbek in minute detail, specifically going through the issues of ancient engineering and applied physics and technology for how the ancients would have built Baalbek. And the author comes out with a very coherent solution, very workable uh, for the time. So I recommend that people look at that. And again, I've tried to take some of that French article and give it to you in English. Of course, if you read French, the, the link to the article will be right there. But Baalbek, again, is a spectacular thing, but it is not the biggest engineering project that was done prior to the modern era. And the author of this article knows that and actually uses other technological feats that we know are very human and compares them with Baalbek. So I'm trying to tap into some of the the fugitive literature, as we like to call it, and get people to information about issues like that. Well, the whole Nephilim passage, uh, Genesis 6, verses 1 through 4, is admittedly weird. Uh, it's one of those go-to weird passages in the Bible that seems to come up, uh, especially among people who would really resist or not have a supernatural worldview. But as weird as it is, the, the key there is a supernatural worldview. If we believe that there are uh, intelligent beings outside our own uh, created world, our own material world, if we believe in this thing we call the supernatural, then what the Bible presents us with here is the possibility at least, and this isn't the only way that you could read Genesis 6, 1 through 4 and take it seriously, but 
we'll just go with it for the sake of the question. If we believe that there is such a thing as supernatural power, supernatural ability, where a divine being could manifest in physical, corporeal form, and that's the way angels are consistently depicted uh, in biblical material, if we believe that they assume flesh, then it stands to reason, and there is biblical precedent for the idea, that their flesh can do things our flesh does. In other words, if you're going to assume flesh, then it brings with it the capacities and in some senses the limitations as well. So a lot of this taking Genesis 6, 1 through 4 uh, as some sort of literal cohabitation really extends from that idea that a supernatural entity who can assume genuine physical form, and again, if you have a supernatural entity, why would you limit a supernatural entity from doing that. Again, on what basis would you have for limiting that property? If you're going to allow for that, then this idea of being able to mingle with human flesh on some level or in some way uh, proceeds from, from those assumptions. But again, that's not the only way to take it, but it certainly is on the table if you believe in a supernatural sort of ability and supernatural existence of certain beings. When it comes to the term Nephilim, uh, to me it's really been surprising. In fact, I've only ever found it in one commentary. Uh, the fact that the spelling of the term Nephilim really does not conform to what you would do as a writer, how you would spell that term if you meant fallen ones. In Hebrew, you would, you would spell it Nephilim, those who fall or those who are fallen. Uh, but we don't have that. We have Nephilim. Uh, you might also opt for Nephulim. That would be a passive spelling uh, using the verb form Nephal, the root Nephal. But we don't have that either. So this idea that Nephilim means fallen ones really does not conform to the way that the word is actually spelled in the Hebrew Bible. And again, I've only ever seen one commentator take note of this, which surprises me. The term itself is best understood as either a noun that comes from Aramaic nafila because that would produce nephilim in Hebrew, or it might be a, an Aramaic verb nafal that would also produce nephilim. Uh, in both cases, you would have uh, either fallen ones in the sense that there's something corrupt about them, there's something malformed. Uh, something uh, uh, in terms of a grotesque or odd appearance. And if it's the noun, nafila, that noun in Aramaic means giant. And th this is important because a lot of scholars feel that the context for Genesis 1 through 11 is Babylon, whether it was composed in the Babylonian era or whether it draws on Babylonian uh, items or motifs for theological purposes. Aramaic was where... Uh, uh, the Hebrews were exposed to the block script and that language because after the cuneiform languages in Babylon, Aramaic was the language of the period. So it makes sense that there would be this, be this connection. The other thing I would say is when you go to other translations of the Hebrew Bible, and specifically I mean here the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and also Targums, which are the Aramaic translation of the Old Testament, in both of those cases, they will use words in their language that mean giant for Nephilim. They don't opt for something more abstract like fallen ones. The Septuagint use, uses gigantes, which is giants. So I think it's very consistent. It's more consistent with the way ancient translators apparently understood the term to argue for the fact that, hey, the spelling's important, and the only way you really get to the biblical spelling is starting with a word that means giant uh, in Aramaic. Yeah, it's really common uh, for Christian apologists and even Christian scholars, of course, to look at wider ancient Near Eastern material uh, to get some traction, get some help for interpreting or justifying uh, the biblical flood story. They'll say that, hey, there's flood stories in all these other ancient cultures and 
look at that, so it must be, again, some collective memory and whatnot. And, and that's legitimate, but the problem is, is a lot of those same uh, sources, those same apologists, will conveniently, for one reason or the other, forget uh, to include a lot of the other details that come along with those comparative flood stories. And one of those would be things like uh, cohabitation or some sort of interaction between the divine world and the human world that results in or produces you know, kind of strange offspring like the Nephilim. I mean, there are other uh, flood stories that have uh, pieces or at least some sort of elements in them that can be tied to Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Uh, the details aren't always exactly the same. In fact, most, in most cases, they're not exactly the same. But they're certainly in the same arena uh, as some of these odder elements in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Well, scholars have noticed for a long time, uh, mainly since the late 19th century, when cuneiform languages were deciphered, They've noticed a lot of similarities between flood stories from Mesopotamia and the biblical flood story. Uh, there are a number of trajectories that you know, scholars follow to think about this. Uh, one of them would be common memory. Since the Bible is an ancient Eastern Mediterranean or ancient Near Eastern document, it stands to reason that it would have similar stories to other cultures in those regions about some event that happened in great antiquity. In other words, there, there's a collective memory sense here that it would make sense if something happened uh, and people in those places in that region knew about it, they would all write about it. They would all have a version of those things. So one of the, the options for this is collective memory. And other options include, especially when you get into the chronology of who wrote what, when, and you know, in relation to what Mesopotamian material the, the Bible was written, there is considerable, or I should say there was considerable debate in the late 19th century about whether the biblical writers borrowed or copied information from more ancient Mesopotamian sources. Uh, practically all scholars in the field today uh, don't use language like that, as though the biblical writer was sitting there at the table and sort of had writer's block and reached over and grabbed a cuneiform tablet that happened to be Atrahasis and said, oh great, I needed that, I'm over the hump now. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this into my text. Uh, scholars just don't look at it that way anymore. Whereas in the late 19th century, uh, more of them were thinking along those things because that was the first time they'd been exposed to finding very similar flood stories in other, other literatures. You know, nowadays, uh, most scholars would look at the material and they would have a keen eye on the differences. A lot of ancient astronaut people just completely skip over the differences. And the differences are important because it, it informs us that the biblical writer isn't just wholesale copying material. Rather, they're responding to the version of events that occurs in other literature, specifically to, to state their theological case about the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, getting credit for either the the punishment of the flood or the resolution of the flood. They're responding to material and they're tracking with it closely enough so that people living at the time would know what they're doing, that they're sort of setting the record straight or they're producing and asserting their own theological claims about these sorts of events. Well, when it comes to the book of Ezekiel, I get the question about its vocabulary a lot because most people assume that you go to Ezekiel 1, you have an ancient spaceship there. Uh, and it's sort of prime fodder for ancient alien material. The problem is, is a lot of people don't even read it closely. Uh, for instance, if you actually look at the Ezekiel account, Ezekiel chapter 1, and a lot of it's repeated in chapter 10, for instance, the only thing that's round in the chapter are the wheels supporting the rakhiach, the platform or the expanse atop of which Yahweh, the God of Israel, is seated. There's nothing else round. And what the reason that's significant is because you look at some of these ancient alien descriptions about Ezekiel chapter 1 and they have the expanse on which Yahweh is sitting 
as a UFO, as though he's piloting some sort of alien craft. But if you actually read the text, the platform, the expanse, is not round. It's never described that way. The other thing about the vocabulary is Hebrew has a lot of words for round objects, other than the word for wheel. I've already said that the word wheel is in there, the four wheels and all that sort of thing. But it has a lot of vocabulary for things that are round. Kikar, uh, Shelet, Yagil. Uh, there are five or six or seven different Hebrew words that are scattered throughout the Hebrew Bible for round things. Shields, loaves of bread, that sort of thing. None of them are found in Ezekiel 1. Not a single one. So the only thing that's round when you get to Ezekiel 1 are the wheels supporting the platform. But Yahweh is not riding around in a spaceship. Uh, the, the wheels, we know what that is. We know what each, each of them are. We know why that description is what it is. Because we have iconography from the Babylonian period. Remember, Ezekiel is writing as a captive in Babylon. We have iconography from Babylonian period, earlier Assyrian periods, Phoenician material. It's a cherubim throne. It's, it's, it's a throne. It's a seat. It's a chair, as it were, mounted atop cherubim. And in some cases, those cherubim had wheels because the gods were pictured and the God of Israel is often pictured in the Hebrew Bible as riding around the sky, you know, traversing the heavens on the clouds. And so the mode of transportation other than boats in the ancient world were chariots and chariot thrones. So these are all very normal descriptions, but other than the wheels themselves, the expanse that people think is a UFO is never described as being round. It's a chariot. It's a throne chariot. And it's very easy to spot and know what Ezekiel's talking about if you're familiar with the ancient Near Eastern material. I get asked a lot, well, if it's not a UFO, what does Ezekiel chapter 1 mean? What does the vision mean? And to really digest this, and again, this, this presents another logical problem with the way ancient astronaut theorists approach Ezekiel 1, you have to sort of dispense with ancient Near Eastern and Israelite cosmology. Uh, you have to get that out of the way to import your flying disc into it. But if you're familiar with ancient Near Eastern cosmology, and biblical cosmology is very consistent with it, the meaning is not only pretty clear, but it's also kind of stunning. Uh, imagine, if you will, the ancient Near Eastern world view of the world is you have a round earth, so you have a round earth that is flat on the bottom, might have something underneath, the, the other world, the off-world world, world uh, the nether world. And it's covered by this dome called the rakhiach, the firmament, the expanse. Now, God was pictured as above all that. He sits on top of the throne. And it, it's, it's even in some places called the flood. Because there were, the, the conception was that on top of this dome there were waters. We know this from the flood account. The waters get sort of dumped down on the earth. But there were waters above, and God sits on top of the waters above the firmament. Now, if you take that to Ezekiel, that's what Ezekiel is actually describing. This is why we have a round sort of you know, firmament expanse kind of thing going on. And then on top of that, we have sort of a, this platform throne, and God is sitting on top of the rachiach, of the expanse. To an ancient Near Eastern person, an ancient Israelite, this is a picture that God rules the earth. And at this point, then the cherubim, the creatures underneath all that are important because they have four faces. And it's not a coincidence that the four faces are the cardinal points of cardinal direction points, but also the cardinal points of the zodiac in Babylonian thinking. Remember, you're Ezekiel. You're an Israelite. You worship Yahweh. You're sitting in Babylon wondering, why in the world are we here? Our God's the best. Why are we here in exile? Did, did Marduk, the god of the Babylonians, did he win? Is he stronger than Yahweh? Well, Ezekiel has a message. He takes stock throne imagery, puts Yahweh on the throne above the earth, and then he goes into Babylonian astrological thinking with the cherubim faces and says, look, who is in command of the way the world works? Who is in command of the passage of time? Who is in command of history? It's not Marduk. 
It's Yahweh, the God of Israel. Even though we're in captivity, God is still in control. It's a very theological message. There's a lot of elements to it when you really get into the details. Uh, Babylon itself, uh, pictured as the navel of the world, the Babylonians called it, the center of everything. Uh, the, where the heavens and earth are run from this place. And Ezekiel's saying, no, they're not. If you take a God's eye view, if he's above uh, the earth, and you, again, you fix the, the cardinal points there, and he's sitting there on the throne, literally from corner to corner to corner to corner, Yahweh is in control. And so Ezekiel, writing not only to Jews in Babylon, who have you know, now, unfortunately, uh, more familiarity with Babylonian thinking than they want to, they'd rather be back in their homeland. But even to Babylonians who would be reading this, hearing the message of Ezekiel, uh, the message is very clear. Yeah, we're here and we're in a bad situation, but our God is still in control. He is not the sovereign of the universe. In terms of iconography, again, what I like to describe as the Polaroids of the Old Testament, ancient world. Again, pictures they left us of the things they're talking about. The idea of a deity seated on a throne that was in effect a chariot that is carried around by supernatural beings with wings, in other words, to describe it as the chariot of heaven, uh, that's very common. But when it's depicted, it's never depicted as what we would think of as a UFO. No triangles, no round disks, nothing like that. It's a chair. It's a throne under which, again, has some sort of platform, and he's seated upon, the deity is seated upon these various heavenly creatures. So we know from literally dozens, even hundreds probably, it would be fair to say, examples of ancient Near Eastern iconography, we know what Ezekiel's talking about.